Hello, my name's Leslie Atherton, and this is a short piece of writing called Nameless. Ten years ago today, I watched as Duncan, my daughter's new husband, stroked her on the back, smoothed her chestnut curls, and planted a kiss on her forehead. In the midst of the wedding party, he was making the promise that she would always be his girl, be protected and loved and looked after. But we came to realise that this came with a price, a tether of sorts, a smooth, lengthy, elastic tether bound with purple velvet. Prettily, it would allow her life within bounds. I watched ten years ago today and I remember this nice enough man following in the footsteps generations above him had written in stone. He was as tethered as she, perhaps even more so. Both were blindly following the universal plan, but I can't pretend I wasn't screaming inside. I wanted so much more for her, as I had for myself. I wanted far more than protectionary limitations, and they're there, dear one. I watched ten years ago today, and now I watch still. My baby's face, all grown up, is drooped now, yet also harder, colder. There's a smile, but not one retained for long. My grown-up baby girl has been in hospital for 15 days, recovering but still unwell, and I know she'll not be home any time soon. Please don't think Duncan's responsible. He's definitely no wife-beater. He doesn't just love her to bits, he shows it too. Still, Duncan's a small, unintended part of what ails her. He is the tender, protective shell she's attempted to peck her way out of. It's just too hard, you see. The walls are centuries old, mortared with custom and expectation. Duncan suffers differently. His walls are softer and far more flexible. My teen daughter was ambitious and strong. She had plans for an academic career and had a strong desire to move to Eastern Europe to follow her talent for the language learned from a Hungarian best friend. She would take work as an interpreter to pay for higher studies and a doctorate in something beyond my comprehension. I was so proud. Still am. But her ambition wasn't to be. They married on her 18th birthday as her gap year began and she miscarried the week later. That year the tethers should have snapped, the walls should have cracked and their adventures should have begun together. But Duncan, being that bit older and having already been to college, got his career, house and wife... My daughter got, oh, I don't know, she got something. But now even Duncan sees it and grieves. Her illness is life-caused. She's done well with unsatisfied longing for something. Not a baby, though. Babies tie knots in the tethers. And all her non-chances, non-strong, non-challenges have sunk deep into her paws. But I love her, I protect her, Duncan insists, from the right side of her security fence. She loves him but does so with a numbed fury rather than passion. He's not missed life's opportunities, so how can she explain? When he asks her what she wants, she isn't sure how to answer, but he would have answers if she asked him. How frightening to articulate. This is not a new car, a move to the country, a laptop, a child. She desires life in its fullness, but also desires non-continuance. Death, if you like. She tells me she wants to be in a place where the lack of a male organ doesn't condemn her as a dimwit. She tells me she feels like a dimwit, using the word as weaponry, as battle cry. You dimwit. Nervous breakdown, the doctor said. We need to help get her through it, protect her, look after her. Duncan says this and awaits my enthusiastic nod, but I scream, no, that's not what she wants, not what she needs. Let her protect herself, she must protect herself. Duncan is the only dissenter, as the doctor and I confer. The doctor has also fought against protection from the vagaries of the outside world. She nods at my daughter, who nods back, understanding a little. Is it too late for me? my girl asks. The doctor shakes her head. You should try some of the craft activities, I suggest. Get out of bed, you're stronger today, it might be time. My vulnerable, soon-to-be-strong girl considers it and nods. Perhaps, she says, and moves from her bed, Duncan and I trailing her. She takes a seat in front of a slab of air-drying clay and seeks instruction from a round-faced instructor who says, do whatever you want. But she can't know, she can't see through closed doors, and anyway the presence of family forces her dependence. So I put my arm round the chivalrous Duncan and we leave the building, Kirsty chatting in our wake. 
Oh yes, I may name her now. Terrified Kirsty, lost in her own life. Helpless Kirsty, who learned to be beautiful, weak and desperate. Once baby Kirsty, who could not live up to her own ambitions, but who may now build more. Pinocchio Kirsty, taking steps to shed the wood and transform into a real woman. Her clay volcano was just the beginning.